Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today for the Mind Skin Connection at this month's MedCan webinar. My name is Tanya Haas, and I am the in-house writer here at MedCan. Hope you're all having a wonderful day. Now, we chose this topic because skincare has been getting a lot of attention lately. And with the rise of skin technology, more and more people are trying to find solutions to their skin ailments. So we thought we would take a different perspective and incorporate not only the traditional medical approach, but also the bio, so the biological perspective, but also we wanted to explore skin health from a psychosocial perspective. So today's focus will be on medical dermatology, psychology, and an emerging branch known as psychodermatology. We will not be covering cosmetic dermatology today. Now, before we get to our presenters, there are a few items I'd like to cover. This presentation is being recorded and a video recap will be live on medcan.com within the coming days. You will also be sent an email of this uh, in the next day. And we will also be uh, sending you a survey to collect your feedback. Now, due to the volume of participants we have joining us, we will be muting all incoming audio. And so if you would like to say something to our presenters, perhaps a question, you can do so right here on this screen. If you see on the, usually on your right hand side, there's a pull down menu. You can put in your question there. Your question will remain anonymous. And if we have time, we will try to address as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. We will also be brief, uh, briefly outlining the services at MedCan that support some of the strategies the panelists will be mentioning today. And finally, just a reminder, the information in this webinar is for educational and information purposes only. It is neither intended to be relied upon nor to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Now, on to our wonderful presenters. Dr. Christy Bailey, uh, she is a, a double board certified dermatologist in Canada and the US. She has a wealth of knowledge and expertise in medical, surgical, and cosmetic dermatology. Dr. Bailey earned her medical degree from the University of Ottawa. She also attained a Master of Science degree in Cancer Research at the University of Toronto. She completed her residency training in Dermatology at U of T, where she served as Chief Resident and was recognized for her research and clinical performance. Dr. Bailey has also actively participated in surgical and cosmetic dermatology clinics in New York, Los Angeles, Boston, Cleveland, and Dallas. She is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, and a diplomat of the American Board of Dermatology, a member of Canadian Dermatology Association, and numerous other societies. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Bailey. Thank you. And then we have Dr. Ricardo Flemenbaum. Dr. Flemenbaum completed his PhD in clinical psychology at Queen's University and is registered with the College of Psychologists of Ontario with practice areas in clinical and rehabilitation psychology. He is a member of the Ontario Psychological Association and the Canadian Association of Cognitive <clears throat> excuse me, and Behavioral Therapies and is a CACBT certified cognitive behavioral therapist. In his clinical practice, Dr. Flemenbaum provides assessment and treatment services to adults with a wide range of clinical problems. He has worked in various hospital-based and private practice settings with a particular focus on mood and anxiety disorders, stress, personality, trauma, occupational injuries, and chronic pain. Prior to joining MedCan, Dr. Flemingbaum worked as a staff psychologist in an interdisciplinary pain management program at Toronto Western Hospital. He has published research in the areas of perfectionism, chronic pain, suicide, and suicide risk factors. Thank you so much for joining us, Ricardo. Thanks for having me. So we are going to cover a lot in the next 45 minutes. It's going to be wonderful. So we are focusing on medical dermatology, the prevalence and types of skin disorders impacted by stress, what is the link between stress and skin health? We hope to get some more clarity on that. And a psychobiological approach to skin health. And then finally, self-care solutions and medical strategies. What can people do on their own? And what can they do with the help of a medical professional? So Christy, I'm gonna pass the mic over to you. Great, thank you, Tanya, that was great. Um, so um, medical dermatology uh, is what we're gonna be talking about today. It's the branch of medicine that deals with the hair, nails, and skin um, and the diagnosis and management of those conditions. There are other branches of dermatology, um, such as surgical dermatology, pediatric or kids dermatology, and cosmetic dermatology. And most dermatologists in Toronto and at MedCan, uh, including myself, are trained in all areas of dermatology. Um, today we're going to focus on the medical aspect. So the photos that you can see on your screen now are a few of the medical dermatology diseases that have a significant stress component to them. 
Before we move on to explore each of these diseases, I'm going to turn it over to Ricardo for a more general perspective on stress and overall health. Okay, thanks, Christine. Um, so <clears throat> before we start uh, talking about the role of uh, psychology and, and, and the link with dermatology, it might be helpful to take a step back and just look at what stress is, what happens to our bodies when we feel stress, and what are some of the consequences of that? Um, so I think first it's important to make a distinction between uh, an acute uh, stress and chronic stress. And our bodies are actually really well equipped for coping with stress on a short-term basis. We have uh, a stress response that allows us to uh, muster up the resources for dealing with that stress, and, and, and we're really good at it but we tend to run into problems when um, that stress is ongoing, when uh, we're not able to shut down that stress response. Um, so I'll, I'll use the example of, um, you know, imagine a zebra out in the savanna. And, um, you know, the zebra is just calmly grazing on, on grass, and then it's attacked by a lion. So it has a response physiologically that allows it to perceive the threat, to respond to it, to maybe run away faster, stronger, and ultimately survive. But then what happens is um, once the zebra has escaped, it comes back down to baseline. So um, that physiological response goes down and the zebra comes back to its normal level of functioning. Um, you know, the zebra doesn't go on thinking about the lion and, you know, how bad that was and how it could have been killed or the next time the lion's going to show up. Um, you know, it doesn't, uh, you know, think about, uh, you know, it doesn't check its phone to think about, the, you know, where the lion is. But uh, as humans, we do that and that's kind of different, right? So, you know, a lot of the stress that we experience is a psychological stress related to worry about an event or anticipation of it. And, uh, and, our physiology responds to it in the same way that it does a situational stress. So um, that chronic type of stress or kind of stress that's primarily psychological in nature uh, tends to be more difficult to cope with and ultimately more harmful. And uh, some of the, the factors that go along with creating more, more stress or making things feel more stressful involve situations where maybe we don't have as much control over the outcome or there's a, a lack of predictability there. Um, if we have this, this view that things aren't likely to improve, right? So if we expect really negative things to happen um, and there's nothing much we can do about it, then that's gonna trigger more of that stress response. Uh, also, if we don't, we don't have uh, outlets as a way to use the energy that uh, the stress response uh, activates. Um, Stress isn't necessarily harmful, right? There is kind of a relationship between our level of stress, so we consider that just our level of physiological, physiological arousal, and our performance. Um, you know, if, if we don't feel stress, we're not likely to do very well. So, for example, in preparing for this uh, presentation, um, you know, if I didn't feel any stress about it, uh, I probably wouldn't have taken the time to prepare. You know, I, I would have wouldn't have felt very motivated to do well. Um, but at very high levels of stress as well, uh, then anxiety starts to interfere with performance. So there is an optimal level of, of stress or arousal that we do want that allows us to be more focused, where our memory is improved, and, um, and uh, even physical performance can be improved. Okay, so let's look at what happens then to our body when we're under stress. So we have this mechanism uh, called the stress response, um, which is actually really adaptive and it and works really well. And, and the purpose of it is to help mobilize and direct our uh, kind of physical resources to help us deal with uh, a threat or a stressor. And so what it does, it, uh, it involves a lot of physiological changes, but essentially it's releasing more energy to the muscle group. So if we're facing a threat, we can run away faster or fight, be stronger to fight it. Uh, our heart rate uh, and breathing increases to get more blood and oxygen to the muscles. Um, and it works really well when we're dealing with the stress in the short term. What, um, what can happen though is when we're faced with chronic stress and this stress response is continually activated, that's when we start to run into trouble. 
Um, so the stress response involves uh, a couple of different uh, systems in the body. One of them is the sympathetic nervous system. And we might know this as the fight or flight response. And so it's a network uh, that involves lots of different muscles and organs in the body. And it's involved with increasing our heart rate, um, dilating our blood vessels, dilating our pu uh, pupils so we're more vigilant. I think we uh, have a picture here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it shuts down other functions that are less important for a threatening situation. So usually more of our uh, physical housekeeping functions, things like uh, tissue and growth repair or digestion or even our immune response. And working together with the sympathetic nervous system, we also have uh, something called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Uh, so this, these are different uh, parts of the brain and different glands that release different hormones, and hormones are uh, uh, messenger chemicals in the body. They trigger the organs to behave and, and, and do different things. So the hypothalamus will work with our limbic system to sense a threat or a stressful situation. It will release uh, uh, CRH to the pituitary gland, which will release corticotropin, which will then travel to our adrenal glands to release uh, cortisol. And cortisol is involved in uh, releasing glucose into our bloodstream and that gets directed to the muscles. There are other hormones that are involved as well. Um, uh, you know, there are increased levels of uh, certain hormones like prolactin, endorphins, uh, and reduced levels of other hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, insulin. So, um, and again, these things are fine and normal when we're dealing with that short-term stress. But when those hormones are released on a continuous basis um, over an extended period of time, it can start, and the impact that it has on our, on our bodies can start to lead to negative health outcomes. So it's been linked to a lot of uh, uh, negative um, health consequences like cardiac problems, um, diabetes, gastrointestinal disorders like irritable, irritable bowel syndrome and ulcers. Um, it can play a role in our immune function as well. So it might uh, re reduce our ability to fight uh, diseases and infections. But in certain cases, it can actually uh, increase our autoimmune response. And that can relate to things like psoriasis as well. Um, our memory can actually improve when, uh, in the very short term when we're dealing with a stressor. But uh, after an extended period of even a couple of hours, uh, our memory and concentration starts to uh, go down. So when people say, uh, Dr. Blum and Mom, uh, stress management, you need to control your stress, you're, they're literally telling us that you need to get your body more regulated? Is that what they're saying? That's right, yeah. So working on uh, different strategies that we'll get to a bit later, of how we can activate uh, this alternative, uh, not alternative, but kind of the opposite physiological system, our parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so if we think of fight or flight as being uh, part of the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for our bodies when we're at rest, right? So it's been termed the rest and, I, rest and digest uh, system. Um, and, and so uh, we'll talk more about that, but um, doing things like uh, relaxation strategies and other techniques are, are ways of um, deactivating our stress response. Um, so, relating to the skin specifically, um, in this field of psychodermatology, they've kind of come up with three different uh, groupings, three different ways that uh, stress or uh, psychology can interact with the skin. And the first one has to do with uh, what's been called psychophysiologic disorders. So, these are primary skin conditions that uh, where um, psychological factors can either play a role in triggering the onset of symptoms or exacerbating the condition. Uh, so that would involve things like psoriasis, eczema, acne. Um, a second cat category uh, has to do with uh, what are primarily psychological or psychiatric disorders, but where it, it has an impact on the skin or, um, or skin problems are a symptom. So for example, trichotillomania, which involves compulsive hair pulling, or also uh, compulsive skin picking. Uh, this can uh, lead to lesions on the skin. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, uh, excessive compulsive hand washing, uh, where after a while that can lead to uh, damage uh, um, to the skin of our hands. 
other more rare conditions as well that involve the skin, so certain types of uh, delusions. So delusions are very um, strong and irrational beliefs. Um, and so there's this delusion of parasitosis, which is a very strong belief that there is a parasite or something implanted under the skin, uh, which actually it leads to altered um, skin perception as well. And then the third category has to do with uh, psychological disorders that are a consequence of certain skin conditions. Um, so for example, with severe cases of uh, acne or other disfiguring uh, skin conditions where might lead to more social isolation or anxiety around negative judgment from other people um, or a reduced sense of self-esteem. So then, you know, that leads to depression and social anxiety as well. And it must be um, interesting in your field to know what comes first, but this third category is called secondary psychiatric disorder. So that is when the disorder mm -hmm. comes and then the reaction. Yeah, so, you know, someone might come into my office and see me because they're uh, depressed and, you know, their skin condition might play a significant role in, um, in, in either triggering that depression or maintaining that depression over time. Um, and, and that's, that would probably be the, the majority of, of cases where if someone would come to me, uh, it would probably be, be because of uh, one of these secondary uh, disorders. Um, I think most often people may not go, may not think of going to a, a psychologist to address uh, something like psoriasis or eczema. Great, thank you so much Ricardo. So we're going to turn now to Christy and we're going to focus on psoriasis which is a common skin condition that causes cells to build up rapidly on the skin surface. It can be itchy and painful, there's emotional stress is one trigger and uh, Christy tells me that 37 to 78 percent of psoriasis patients believe stress affects their skin. Stress may even worsen psoriasis severity and may lengthen the time to disease clearance. So Christy, over to you. Stress can really um, exacerbate this condition. Uh, so it's really important we try to get the stress under control. Um, one uh, way that um, some research suggests psoriasis um, can be triggered by stress is with some of the brain systems that hypothalamus pituitary adrenal system that Ricardo talked about earlier. Um, there's still research going on in these areas to figure out um, what exactly are the main players that's leading to stress-induced psoriasis. But um, we know that psoriasis it's, itself can actually lead to significant adverse psychological effects as well. Um, and so it's really important to break this stress cycle. Um, psychotherapy and possibly pharmacotherapy are, are good options. Um, and then um, we're going to talk about a little bit more on the different treatment options in, in psychotherapy um, very soon, so we'll look forward to that in a bit. Um, we're just going to go move on now to another condition called eczema, and um, this is a chronic inflammatory skin condition, and it causes your skin to become dry, red, itchy. It's usually in the folds of the skin, so back of the knees, um, the inner surface of the, of the elbow, um, usually kind of starts in childhood, although you can get it in adulthood. Um, there's um, periods of flares and remissions, or periods when it gets really bad and periods when it's not too bad. Um, the mechanism of these flares is poorly understood, um, although there is a lot of evidence to suggest that stress has a significant component. Um, it's thought that neuropeptides are upregulated in the brain and organs. These are proteins that can affect your sensory nerves and they regulate inflammation and skin barrier function. And one of the problems with eczema is that your skin barrier um, isn't functioning normally. Uh, and so you have uh, this red itchy skin and then if your sensory nerves are getting stimulated even further with these proteins from your stress, you're gonna have an even worse time trying to control that eczema. Um, Next, there's a condition called pruritus, which really just means itching. Um, sometimes itching is a symptom of a skin condition. Sometimes it's a symptom of something internal. And sometimes it can be a symptom of a psychological disease. Um, and as dermatologists, it's sort of our job to determine which category you fit into. Um, no matter what the cause is, generally itching on your skin is strongly associated with a poor quality of life impaired sleep, and depression. So it's really important that we look into the mind with um, itching skin as well. And then 
then we have this itch scratch cycle. So basically, whenever you itch your skin, you excite some of the nerves in the skin, which then leads to more itching and more scratching. And then um, we uh, run into this vicious cycle here, similar to um, the stress cycle that we described before. Yeah, and I'm thinking one, possibly one way that stress can impact on that is, you know, we have a part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in um, inhibiting our our behavior, right? Controlling our behavior. And it, so it, it's really good that we have this part so we're not acting on our impulses all the time. Um, but this part of the brain tends to be less active the more anxious and stressed we are. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, we can act more impulsively or, you know, it's it's often a reason why we tend to make poor uh, food choices when we're feeling more stressed. Um, it's just harder to make decisions and, and control our uh, impulses. So an impulse like, um, you know, the urge to scratch, right? We may be less able to uh, tolerate that and to uh, kind of delay or not act on that response uh, if uh, if we're feeling more stressed. Is it possible that when people are itching, is it is it a um, an impulse that there, there actually isn't anything itchy there? Are people scratching just because they want to scratch? Yeah, it's definitely um, possible. So once you sort of get that itch scratch cycle going, um, even if it was originally from a dermatologic condition or even from a systemic condition, even if those have been treated, you can continue to scratch for a number of months afterwards if you've stimulated this itch scratch cycle. And, and because there is a sense of uh, kind of relief that comes from scratching, that, bec that becomes self-reinforcing. So it kind of uh, keeps the behavior going, right? The more we enforce something, the more we're going to do it. Um, and so that's kind of a psychological mechanism behind this. And so acne, um, very common condition. Um, you usually think of a teenager, but definitely you can have acne into adulthood. Um, it can have a considerable psychologic impact, um, including anxiety and depression. Um, it can be quite stressful. Yeah, and often, I mean, teenagers, but there's adult acne. It's what is causing it. Is it genetics? Is it your skincare products? Is it because you're sleeping on your pillow that's causing it? It's, it can be so frustrating for people. When, you know, Dr. Bailey, when people come to you with regards to acne, uh, how much do you give stress management um, a focus? Or do you, do you focus right on what they can do, topical pre treatments, their diet? Yeah, so um, basically the root of all acne is hormone related, which is why it tends to come on in the teenage years. Um, oftentimes it's difficult to treat hormones. We don't like to interfere with them too much. Um, so um, generally we kind of start with some creams. We do look at their skincare routine, um, certain oils on the face or constantly resting the hand on the face. Things like that can, can contribute to acne as well. And then uh, Stress, um, it can cause acne. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there's some inflammatory um, proteins and things that can be activated, which can affect the skin and, and possibly give you acne. Um, I often find that acne is the cause of a lot of stress, especially in these teenagers. Right, yeah, you had a case study I think you wanted to share. Right, yeah. So um, we see this often as a um, case where we have a young teenager um, who actually goes a little bit beyond being stressed and ends up with severe depression related to their acne. And this particular girl that I saw, um, she saw herself as unattractive. She refused to go to school, wouldn't go out of the house, um, always kind of covered her face, wore a hood. Um, and with a combination treatment, we had a psychologist come in, a family doctor, a psychiatrist, as well as, as myself as a dermatologist, we all worked together to um, come up with a good treatment plan for her to try and clear her of her acne, uh, but also to make sure that we're covering the mind component and helping with her uh, depression and stress and getting her back to school. Wow, that's a lot of people. Who are... <laughs> it is, but um, I don't know how much we want to get into this, but Accutane is really the only treatment that can cure somebody of acne. About 70% of people won't get acne anymore the rest of their lives. 
So it's really the best treatment, but there are some reports of depression and suicide associated with this medication. So we have to be very careful in somebody who already has depression, um, which is why it's very important that we involve so many different team members um, and make sure they're followed very, very carefully. And with Accutane, does that, so does that focus on the hormones? Because you were mentioning... Um, actually, no, it focuses more on the oil glands that creates acne, so it kind of shrivels them up, so your hormones are still kind of there doing their thing as they should as a normal teenager, um, but they're not able to trigger the acne because the glands have been shriveled up by the medication. So it's pretty severe, not just at everyone on who has acne should be going on Accutane? No, definitely not. It's reserved for severe cases of acne usually these big kind of cystic lesions or they're starting to get scarring or you've really tried everything else, the creams and the other pills and nothing's working. Right. So actually let's talk about those other options um, before the medication. So uh, we wanted to see how we can combine our psychological expertise here with our dermatological expertise and the whole psychodermatology field. Um, I think, Ricardo, I'm going to pass it over to you. What can people do on their own, and when when should they seek professional support? Hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, the idea behind managing stress, right, if we think that um, when we're feeling stress, our, our sympathetic nervous system is kind of constantly being activated, or right? we're having a hard time shutting down that stress response. So a lot of it has to do with working on strategies that will help to activate this other system that we have called the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so if we think of sympathetic nervous system as being the fight or flight mechanism, the parasympathetic ner nervous system is the rest and digest, right? So it's responsible for our bodily functions when we're at rest. So uh, taking time, you know, actively practicing relaxation strategies like progressive muscle relaxation or diaphragmatic breathing, um, taking time to wind down and, and uh, participate in enjoyable or, or relaxing activities. Uh, social support is, is really important as well. Um, with exercise too, it's, it's a good way to, um, to reduce the stress response and use the resources uh, like the, the excess energy and things like that that have been mobilized by our, uh, by our stress mechanism. And, and making sure that we get enough sleep, right? That's probably uh, one of the most important things. Oftentimes when we're stressed, we, uh, you know, will reduce how much sleep we get. So really um, maintaining our regular sleep routine uh, so we have that chance to, to recharge. And, and physiologically, too, sleep is helping to uh, reduce those level, the, the level of those uh, stress hormones in the body. Um, but like I discussed before, a lot of the stress that we feel is um, of the harmful stress is due to these psychological components, right? So the way that we perceive a situation. And so that's where something like cognitive behavioral therapy can be really helpful, which helps us to look at um, kind of negative thoughts or beliefs that might be playing a role in how we interpret a situation or our sense of control over the situation and, and working on, on addressing that and developing more effective ways of, uh, of coping. Um, you know, sometimes CBT will be involved with uh, creating more uh, kind of cognitive flexibility. So, for example, if we're very perfectionistic about something, and which is, you know, not always a bad trait to have, you know, it, it allows us to kind of uh, oftentimes succeed and achieve things. But if we have a lot of things on our plate, we can't be perfectionistic about everything. That will result in a lot more stress. And so being able to be more flexible about what we focus on. Um, so that's, uh, those are some ways that uh, uh, more formal therapy can be helpful. Um, and practicing mindfulness as well. Uh, mindfulness is, um, you know, is linked to a lot of uh, positive outcomes relating to uh, uh, reduced stress and our ability to be less reactive to stress, right? Less reactive to the types of negative thoughts that will uh, increase our level of stress as well. Um, and, and that even happens at um, not just an emotional, but a physiological level as well, um, that the body just doesn't um, trigger that same level of distress response uh, in, in various situations. I guess, Christine, when you're hearing uh, Ricardo speaking to this, uh, how do we manage people's expectations? So if people are suffering from psoriasis or uh, hives, for example, how much 
can they hope for better results or better outcomes if they do adopt a lot of these these uh, strategies or even seek help professionally? Yeah, so I think it's really a combination approach. I think it's definitely going to help for sure. Um, as a dermatologist, we try to treat the skin conditions with different prescription creams, different prescription pills. Um, but if they're not also dealing with their stress or associated anxiety or even depression, the creams and pills aren't going to work to to fix the whole person. So it's really a combination approach. Mm -hmm. And then Ricardo, would, is there any, before we go to questions, is there anything that you feel that we haven't had the chance to talk about yet? Uh, or any questions you have for Christy, perhaps? Uh, no, I, I think she's been very thorough in, in providing the, the dermatolo dermatological perspective as well. And um, yeah, I think it's really, you know, more and more we're seeing that these different conditions, whether whether it's skin disorders uh, or things like uh, chronic pain or other health conditions are really biopsychosocial problems, right? They're, they involve our kind of biological system, but there's also the, the psychological component, whether it's as a, a, a contribution to the disorder or a reaction to it, and the social elements to well, as well, right? Um, how supportive is our environment is also a factor in this. Um, yeah, so it's really important to treat the whole person, right? Not just to treat the, the condition. I mean, um, from Eastern medicine, oftentimes uh, the skin is determined as a reflection of your inner health. You know, it's a representative of your nervous system. Uh, what, um, Christy, when when you talk to people and you're incorporating the psychosocial behavior, like what what are your hopes for a psycho, this whole term of psychodermatology? Do you think that this is a trend? Do you think this is where dermatology is going, medical dermatology? Um, I think it's definitely a trend. People are more aware uh, and more stressed. <laughs> um, so um, I think it's important. I think as dermatologists, we don't think about it often enough. We just sort of see the skin condition, want to treat it, end of story. Um, so I think this uh, webinar and, and um, there's some other research going on out there too into this new uh, psychodermatology category. So I think uh, it will become more of a trend and more of uh, my colleagues and even myself will start to think more about the mind when we're looking at the skin and, and trying to refer to the proper people. And then we're going to we have some questions here, but I think also where where does nature come into play, like genetics, if you're just genetically predispos predisposed? For sure, a lot of the skin conditions have a genetic predisposition. So psoriasis, eczema, a lot of the skin conditions we talked about, they have a genetic predisposition. So uh, in a way, you sort of have it internally, um, and you just kind of have to keep it under control. And as dermatologists, we like to keep it under control with creams and, and different pills, but then there's also ways of keeping it under control by trying to lower your stress. And then certain skin conditions have other triggers as well, like smoking, so trying to eliminate those other triggers are important also. Right. Okay, well, we do have a few questions, so while the panelists are reviewing the questions, I'm going to take a few moments to speak to the mind and skin services here that we offer at MedCan. So if, remember, uh, you can submit your questions in that panel on the side. So first off, I'd like to speak to Mind Health at MedCan. Um, if you are someone, you or someone you care about is struggling with conditions mentioned today, like stress, self-esteem, depression, or anxiety, or if you're hoping to go from ill to well or good to great, uh, MedCan, Mind Health can help. Uh, it's a team made up of psychologists and psychotherapists with expertise and experience in individual, relationship, and family counseling. Our team can help you control aspects of your mind health through high quality, personalized, customized care. And we understand that integrating technology into a team based approach is important to achieve your overall health and well being. We do have video consults and in person consults available, and Dr. Flemenbaum is one of those from the team mm -hmm. members on the Mind Health. And then also we have Refine by MedCan. This is our medical and cosmetic dermatology here at MedCan. Let me just get the right script, pardon me. Uh, so our brand new state-of-the-art dermatology clinic, Refine by MedCan, offers the best in medical and cosmetic treatments. If you've ever come to our office at 150 York, you would see that. Uh, please join us, it's on the, on the street level. Based on your specific skin health, our skin consultants will develop a personalized treatment plan for you on one of our by one of our eight dermatologists, plastic surgeons, or licensed medical anesthet anestheticians. 
And so you can see on the screen here, we have many services from skin, care, skin cancer screening programs, non-invasive skin rejuvenation treatments, injectables, procedures, and plastic surgery consultations. You can email us at refine at medkin.com or call 416-350-5938. Uh, okay, so we're going to go to some questions now. Uh, so the first question is related to, uh, if, if someone is asking if they went to a yoga retreat and didn't have any stress for one month, would they be cured of all their skin elements? Will they ever be cured of all their skin elements? Ricardo, I'll, I'll ask you to, <laughs> to address that one. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, wouldn't that be nice, right? Like, I think probably not. Um, I mean, one way to think about it is um, stress doesn't, uh, directly cause um, these things. It's um, it, it's really you think about it as the the stress response over time um, kind of creates the conditions where these things are more likely to emerge, and whether that is manifested as a as a skin condition or a cardiac problem, a lot of that has to do with the biological makeup of the person, right, and how they're. Um, you know how susceptible they are to these things and and uh, and how likely they are to express them. Um, so it's possible that uh, you know it, it might uh, improve the condition to some extent, but probably not be a cure. Yeah, and then I'll just add to that. Um, if you think about having high blood pressure, in order to control it, you have to take every pill, uh, one pill every day for the rest of your life to keep the blood pressure under control. Um, skin diseases are very similar. We can't just give you one pill or one cream and it's going to go away forever. It's really um, almost a lifelong process of getting the skin condition under control. Um, so just one thing to keep in mind, the yoga retreat uh, might help, but <laughs> it's going to require lifelong yoga retreats as well as creams and other things. Right. And yeah, Ricardo, is there like a framework that someone can can adopt for recognizing, you know, taking a blood pressure pill that's not necessarily a negative thing, it's almost a positive thing. How can you adopt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's, um, you know, an important psychological component, right? That if you view these things as kind of, uh, that there's a negative interpretation attached to it, right? Or that it means something negative about you, uh, you're gonna experience uh, that as more more stressful, right? And, and um, and so coming to see that as, you know, just something that you do to take care of yourself, right? Just like you might, uh, you know, make sure you wash your face every day, right? Or use certain creams, you know, seeing a, a pill possibly as part of that uh, healthy regimen. All right. Next question. I'm getting married this summer and I just know I'll be stressed up leading to the big day. Are there any treatments you'd recommend to prevent acne flare-ups and breakouts? Um yeah, so definitely there's lots of acne treatments out there. The best thing really is to have your family doctor refer you to a dermatologist and as early as possible. Um, most of the treatments take about three months at least to fully kick in and start working. Um, so the earlier you get started on a treatment plan, the better. Um, but it is possible, even with a bit of wedding stress, to be clear for your wedding day. Thanks. All right, this question, I think you did speak to it, Ricardo. I understand that there are different types of stress, stress that motivates you. Can you differentiate the types of stress that contribute to poor skin health? I don't know if we can do that specifically. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if there's kind of a type of stress that directly links up uh, to skin, but um, but I think keeping in mind this idea that you know we tend to do okay if it's a short-term, uh, moderate level of stress, right? It's when it's very intense or over a sustained period of time, um, and you know if there's that kind of uh, kind of negative psychological component to it as well. Um, yeah, and so it's, um, you know, stress isn't necessarily harmful. It's uh, how, we, how we manage that. Sometimes stress is unavoidable, too. So if we know that it's more more um, stressful period, we can try to mitigate some of that impact uh, with, uh, you know, certain lifestyle factors, you know, making sure we're getting enough sleep and exercise, so not letting go of those things, uh, looking at how you manage your time as well. So you know you're not packing your schedule, but leaving a little bit of uh, a little bit of a buffer there, right? Just to deal with things that might come up unexpectedly, uh, or just to give a chance for your mind to catch up, right? I often use the analogy of you know think of your mind like a balloon at the end of a long string. Uh, you, you know if you're getting somewhere really fast, it, it takes a little bit bit of time for that balloon to catch up, right? So 
you know, just allow yourself the time for that to happen. Well, I think we're going to end on that note with a beautiful balloon. I think um, what I've learned today, and I'm sure a lot of our, our listeners, is the importance of uh, mind health and our entire body health and how it incorporates, you know, eat, how we eat, how we move, how we think, and the medical first perspective that we got here today. So I do want to thank uh, Dr. Christy Bailey for joining us. Dr. Ricardo Flemenbaum, thank you so much to both of you for all the uh, work you put into it. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact us here at MedCan. Thank you so much and hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.